Great. Uh, so first, I'm going to introduce you to CEOs Amsterdam. Uh, we're an initiative for students, by students, uh, and we focus on open science practices. It was founded over two years ago at the University of Amsterdam, and we are still going pretty strong. Uh, our goal is to spread the awareness uh, of importance to do open science. Uh, we do that by either organizing lectures, workshops like this one, and being active on social media with newsletters and articles. We also believe that the change begins at the university level. So we also focus on familiarizing students and future researchers with these practices at the very beginning of their scientific career. Uh, today, we want to introduce you to Git, which is an innovative and easy way to collaborate on projects with colleagues all over the world. And some of you might already be familiar with Git GitHub, which is the world's most popular Git platform. Uh, whatever might be the case, uh, today we have Julia Haaf with us, who will walk you through the basics of Git so that you can start or maybe continue uh, on the journey towards an uh, open scientific community even today. Uh, the way that we'll handle questions is that uh, if at any point you feel something is unclear or want further clarification, uh, ask it in the chat uh, and I will uh, call the questions out uh, and uh, you will get an immediate response uh, or after Julia finishes her sentence. Uh, and now I'm going to leave the floor to Julia. Julia, thank you so much for doing this with us. And yeah, take it away. Hi, everyone. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll put the link to the slides in the chat. Um, so you can also access them later. And because this is such a short time, uh, we really don't have time to kind of have you do all the stuff in Git at the same time while, while I'm talking. So if you want to go through the slides again and, and work with Git a little bit and get familiar with it, then um, you can use those slides. Uh, that I just uh, put in the link. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, so I hope everyone can see can see the slides now. Perfect. Um, so uh, maybe uh, yeah uh, um, yeah let's let's just get started right away. So here's again the link uh, to the slides. Um, Maybe as a little bit of background uh, to uh, to me, so I'm an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam in the Psychological Methods Department, and I've been working with Git for a very long time. I actually started working with it for my master thesis. So my master's project was hosted by uh, uh, on a GitLab server, and um, um, we really used it to collaborate on on a lot of these on a lot of research projects. And so that's why I really recommend starting early because once you get into the habit of using it, um, it's really, uh, it, it really helps and it really helps you to get familiarized and to automatize these processes. All right, um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction. So um, Git, um, people who are familiar with it uh, usually come from IT or from computer, computer science. And so one question that I do hear a lot from especially even especially older researchers is why why should we even use computer science tools in science right why what what does it help and so the way i typically respond to that is i go back to the replicability crisis and that ha obviously has an immediate relationship with um uh, see us and your your guys's mission um so we have these failures to replicate um apparent fraud um and also the fact that there were improbable findings in the literature and the typical solutions that are proposed um, out there are to change the incentive structure of science, to be transparent and open, for example, by um, publishing your data, and to change the statistical approaches that we use um, in our research. But what all of these proposed solutions have in common is that they assume that we do stuff on purpose, right? So all of these problems that we have in science can be fixed if people just didn't do the bad things that they do. Problem is there are things that we do not do on purpose, right? We make mistakes. And so how do you, uh, how do you deal with these mistakes? Um, oh, I see someone said the link. So you have, you can scroll through the slides um, by usually, but maybe this also helps. Uh, 
uh, use use arrow keys left and right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, there are mistakes that can happen. For example, you can make an, a coding mistake, and then you get uh, dif uh, different results or, or mistaken results in your analysis, and so on. And so um, these mistakes have have real life consequences, or you know, have consequences for science and for our literature because. Um, as we know from uh, Michelle Nauten and colleagues, um, there are lots of mistakes in the literature, especially if you look at just, just if you look at uh, the statements of statistical tests that you can see in papers, right? Just there, we have so many mistakes and almost you know, half the papers that are out there. Um, and that's obviously a huge problem. And what's probably an even bigger problem is that there's also bias in these mistakes. So um, there's actually a pretty old, uh, older literature on from from sociology that shows that um, simple mistakes tend to go in a scientist's preferred direction. So if you make a simple mistake and it goes into the direction of your expectation, right? So it, you know you, your p-value is less than 0.05 and everything is, looks beautiful, then you might not catch it. If it goes into the opposite direction, if it goes against your um, hypothesis, then you might want to inspect your data more and figure out what's going on, right? So because we we tend to react to things that are counterintuitive or counter our expectation more, we will also find mistakes more often if they go against our um, hypothesis. And then one other problem is also persistence. So once we have these mistakes in the literature, it's almost impossible to detect them. And even if we detect them, correction in published literature is very difficult. So um, that kind of you know, gives rise to a lot of the problems that we have right now uh, with the replicability. And so one big aspect that might help with this is uh, coding, uh, using programming languages, using R for your analysis, um, because that leaves a trail, right? You can publish a script. Uh, you can uh, have other people figure out what you did step by step. And um, uh, you can also work with others on code. Uh, you know, uh, we think of team science. Uh, you can check e each other's work, and that's critically important uh, to find mistakes because obviously people make lots and lots of coding mistakes. And you can also share your code with others. So that's also part of transparency, right? You can share your analysis code and make sure that other people can check it if they wanted to. And one aspect that can really help with this is version control. Um, and so Git and the topic for today is really about uh, version control and how that can kind of help you uh, to uh, do your analysis in a safe manner uh, and not uh, lose everything with one click or something like that. And also how to collaborate using version control. All right, so what is version control? It's a system that records changes to a file or a set of files over time so that you can recall specific versions later. So um, actually there's lots of software that does this. There's even version control in Dropbox. Um, it's only a little bit diff more difficult to recover that stuff. So if, if you try to go to older versions in Dropbox, um, you know, it might take you a little bit longer. With, with Git, what we're talking about today, that is basically the entire purpose of the system. So um, looking at older versions, comparing older and newer versions of the same file uh, is really something that Git uh, has perfectioned. Um, there's a history of all changes uh, in a version control system. So that means you know who did what when and um, who then worked on it and what did they do, right? Uh, so even if it's just about, okay, oh, my supervisor made changes in my file. I don't know what happened. Let me go back and compare what what the version was before and what the version is now and see whether I'm, agree I'm even agreeing with these changes. Um, version control can help with that. And it also helps to avoid uh, mistakes, um, specifically working on the wrong version of a file um, or deleting files mistakenly. Uh, you can always recover the old version. So uh, deleting is pretty difficult if you use uh, version control. Um, and so uh, this is especially, um, helpful if you ever had a project where you had, say, 10 different versions of the same file in the same folder. One's called v v2, one's called underscore v3, final, final, final x, right? So 
all of that is not necessary if you use a ver good version control system because you can just go back to the versions. They, they didn't disappear, so you don't even have to make a new file. You don't have to copy it over anywhere. <clears throat> and uh, what's also really ideal uh, in a lot of version control systems is merging changes of multiple collaborators in one file. So if you work on a project together with other people, um, ver uh, version control systems can really help with that as well. All right, so there was a little bit of a, in preparation for this talk, a little bit of a, a um, communication thing about are you using Git or are we using GitHub and what is Git and what is GitHub and what are the differences? And so I thought, why don't, why don't I uh, explain this a little bit? So um, here's just a screenshot from uh, my uh, GitHub page. If I log in, this is what I see. So GitHub is uh, what's on github.com. This is a platform. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Let me show you a couple of other um, uh, platforms that are out there for version control. Here's GitLab. Um, that's from gitlab.com. So GitHub, GitLab. Um, the GitLab thing has a cute fox. That's probably one of the biggest distinctions. There are a couple of things that work very, a little differently, but it is very, very similar to GitHub. This is another GitLab. Uh, this is actually hosted by the University of California. So a lot of universities have their own Git platforms that are internally hosted on the own servers of universities. I don't think the University of Amsterdam has that, but I've, I've worked on different universities that do. And that's quite nice for research projects, obviously, because you have them on the own server. Um, it's kind of private, you know, um, so that's uh, really helpful uh, if you work uh, or move to a university that has uh, uh, their own Git system, it does make a lot of sense to use it. This is my website. Um, and the reason I show this is because it's also hosted by Git. So um, the, the, this is what the folder looks like on my computer where my website is, where all the content of my website is. And what you notice is there's this .git folder in it which basically just means, oh, this is a Git repository. That's what the folder structure in Git is called. This is a Git repository. And uh, I can use Git to make changes on my website. So I use that as a version control system to track changes on my website. So you can do a whole lot of things with Git. And only one aspect of that is really what GitHub does. So GitHub is one platform that uses Git as version control system and makes it pretty easy to access Git. So it provides free and easy storage of repositories. The, as I said before, those are the projects um, that you, uh, the, that's what Git, the, in Git language is a, a project, is a repository. And um, it's mainly free. There are also paid versions, right? But if you just have a bunch of projects, you just use it as a, as a student, then uh, the free version is, is good enough. And it's uh, accessible. It's also widely used, right? This is definitely a very popular platform, but it's not the only one. Git, on the other hand, is the version control system that is behind all of these platforms. Uh, it's uh, hugely popular. I would say it's really the status quo in IT uh, for any programmer, right? So um, most people that I know from computer science work with Git. Um, and it is also a pretty developed system. It's very mature. And that means it's really not built for beginners, which is a bit unfortunate for us uh, for the current uh, purpose. But that doesn't mean you can't start somewhere. So there's a lot of things you can learn about Git. And that's why it sometimes uh, is a bit overwhelming in the beginning. But that doesn't mean you can start with very simple aspects of Git that still help you with your research. And then once you are familiarized with that aspect, you can expand and, and use more of the Git universe. So if you think about GitHub versus Git, I would say that learning to navigate GitHub is good for your current use, but learning Git itself is good for kind of life, right? So it's good for the next 10 years of your, of your research career um, because GitHub changes quite regularly, so even I think last year there were a couple of changes in the GitHub platform that kind of rearrange stuff, but Git itself doesn't change. Uh, it didn't change in the last 10 years that I used it. So um, it, it definitely helps uh, to get familiar with it. All right, so 
as I said before, this is a Git is a mature system. Uh, it's very developed, which means there's lots of lots of things I could talk about, um, but I don't really have time for that. So we'll have to make a selection. Um, I will briefly go into kind of you know what is Git. It's uh, how, what is it good for, um, and then we will talk about how to use Git in uh, conjunction with, with our studio um, because you need to you know most people are happy if they have a user interface for Git, and so we'll use our studio as a user interface. And then we'll talk about a very limited set of things uh, from the Git workflow. So the minimal Git workflow that you could possibly use um, are basically these three things, uh, add, commit, and push. And then I will also provide a couple of additional slides if you want to go more into detail on stuff. Uh, so um, um, there are links in the slides that you can use uh, to look at that. All right. So um, first of all, what, what is Git? Um, I've always tried to find a good flowchart um, for this uh, that is on the level that I want to explain it, but I have not been successful. So this is my own <laughs> attempt to a flowchart. At some point, I will make it nicer, but today was not the day. So essentially, there are two, two important aspects to uh, what Git does and how Git works. And that's what happens on your computer that's what we call local, and what happens remotely on the remote repository. And in, in the case of a workshop today, and for most uh, applications, that's going to be on GitHub. So let's start on your local machine. So let's say you have a working directory. That's your folder with the work that you've done, a couple of R scripts, something like that. Then um, that is just locally saved. There's nothing, Git doesn't know that it needs to do anything with it. So you have to kind of announce Git like, hey, there's something you need to know. Um, so that's what Git add does. It puts fault, uh, you know, files from your working directory to a staging area. And then with Git commit, uh, you go from the staging area to a local repository. So you tell Git, okay, please add this to my local repository. This is essentially mirrored by the remote repository. So we have one version that's local repository that's on your computer and one that's uh, on the server in the cloud, right? And so using git push and git pull, uh, the local and the remote repository can communicate with each other and update, right? So I can, let's say I have an update on my local repository. I, I worked on stuff, I changed things. Then I use git push, push to tell the remote repository that there are some updates and that it has to um, go to a newer version. So that's kind of the system. So a lot of things actually happen on your laptop itself. And only if you use git push and pull will the local and the remote communicate with each other. And then the nice thing is, well, somebody else might have a local, another computer, or you have another computer. And then you can do the same things uh, from that machine and also communicate with the remote repository. So if I want to make sure that I have the same files that you do on your machine, we both have to communicate with the remote, remote repository. That's the only path of communication essentially for Git. So that's the, you know, uh, 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 roughly what Git does. What can it do? Well, it can do quite a bit. Um, um, and we will only talk about part of the functionality. Um, the One of the biggest advantages for Git is that it can uh, be used to work on one product in large teams. So this is especially the case, you know, if you have a, a big program or a big uh, um, product that uh, people you work in, in, in computer science on, and then they, you can have teams of 20, 30 people who work on the same project, but on different aspects of it, for example, and they can do this at the same time without hating each other too much. You can also work on things that can break, which is possibly the case for anything that is in code, right? You can always break things. Um, and that's great because then you can go back in your version control. Um, one thing that's important to know is that Git can only integrate and show changes in text files. Um, that sounds a bit limiting, but actually lots of the files that you guys use are text files. So any um, R file or uh, lots of you know coding files or something like that are also text files. What it 
it can track binary files and binary files are something like images or PDFs. Um, so that's like the output files, um, but it cannot uh, track changes. So it can, you know, update them, but it cannot show you the differences between different versions. Um, it's getting a little better to work with Word files um, and Git, but uh, this was not the in initially the plan of Git. So um, they are kind of trying to work on that, but it's still um, sometimes a little bit difficult, I would say. Okay, so let's dive right into the setup that you need on your computer and um, then also how to you know, make your own repository and all of that stuff. And if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and Martin can uh, let me know about them. Oh, yeah, I see so one. Yeah. Okay, see. Uh, okay. So the question is, can you talk a bit about the difference between collaborating on Git versus the open science framework from the center of open science? Yes. Um, yeah, so for a while now I had this, I was, I'm, I'm kind of sad that they didn't take the opportunity uh, for the OSF uh, to actually just build it on a Git version, right? So um, you could have done something like GitLab or GitHub just for the OSF, right? Uh, where each um, um, project on the OSF has its own Git uh, repository and people can either use the Git or they just upload the stuff uh, regularly like, like you usually do now. Um, that said, um, as someone also mentioned, there is actually a link now between Git repositories and the OSF. So you can have a Git repository that is linked to an OSF repository and then can say, okay, I'll work on the Git repository and then you know, at some point match it to the OSF repository or that gets up updated automatically. So that is possible. Um, I would say um, uh, the biggest advantage is that a lot of the stuff you do with Git is more automized and it can be more integrated in your workflow um, while with the OSF, uh, what most people do, right, is they just upload files by hand. So you, you know, click and upload stuff. And that for me is really tedious. So <laughs> I think um, what's nice about Git is that it's more integrated. You can make uh, quicker updates. Uh, I typically update uh, at least once a day, most of the time, uh, you know, push on the repository. Most of the time I would do that several times a day. Um, or, you know, add commits uh, because uh, I, I just want to keep up to date uh, with stuff. And especially if we work with people who work on the same project at the same time, that can be very helpful. All right. Um, so set up on your computer. So if you want to use Git, as I said before, this is Git usually, you know, that's like the, the version control framework. And so it doesn't have its own user interface, which can be a little bit tricky when you get started. Um, so I typically use the uh, terminal if I uh, interact with Git, but there are lots of people who don't use the terminal or don't like to use the terminal. And so there are other ways of doing that. Um, you can install an additional interface. There are plenty of different interfaces out there for Git. Um, one of them is uh, one from GitHub. So there is GitHub, the website where you know you get access to the server and you can uh, make a new repository and all of that. But there's also a user interface, a program that you can install on your uh, computer. And that is the uh, user interface for interacting with Git and with GitHub. Some people really like it. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I can, I, I can say that most people seem to be pretty happy with it. Um, what you can also use is um, our studio as a user interface. And for lots of uh, students that I work with, this is super convenient because they already use our studio for other stuff. So they don't have to install anything additionally. And that's why I also recommend it. Um, it's pretty minimal a user interface, but it works for most purposes. Um, so this is what it looks like in our studio. Um, you you know, if you think this, you know, you have your R Studio with a couple of windows open, typically in the right, upper right one, there can be a, a, a new tab that's called Git, and it has a couple of uh, different buttons, and it also shows you some sort of folder structure, and we'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail in a second. So 
to get uh, started with Git in our studio, uh, you need to do two things. Uh, the first one is uh, you have to go to tools, global options, and then there's uh, this uh, uh, tab uh, Git SVN. And there you have to make sure that this uh, enabled version control interface for our studio projects is uh, the tick marks on and also uh, that you have a Git executable program in here. So you have to tell our studio where does my Git program, where is that located? So you have to install Git to, to do this. Uh, on Windows, that would be git.exe. Um, I think on Mac, this typically works automatically. So that's um, more a problem with Windows that sometimes it can't find where um, the Git uh, program is located. All right, uh, the second thing you have to do is to um, set your name and email address for Git. This is a one-time thing. Um, you just have to tell Git uh, who you are. Um, so once you uh, installed it, um, you can do this, for example, using the terminal in our studio. So the terminal is not the console. So console is for um, uh, programming in R and using R language. The terminal is something separate but it should also be a tab that is automatically open uh, in your RStudio. If not, you can find it uh, pretty easily actually. Um, and so if you do that, then you can type these git config things in here. You don't really have to tell git your real name. It doesn't know. It also doesn't know whether this is an email address or not, as long as it's in the right format. So you know, if, even if you just copied this over to the terminal, it would already work. But you can obviously also put your own name in it. Uh, there's no reason not to do that. OK, so once these two things are set, uh, we can go ahead and make our first uh, repository. So I'll go over to, um, I will go over to GitHub uh, itself. Um, but I also have some slides for these, for these next steps that I'm going to do on GitHub. So if you want to do this later on uh, uh, after the talk, um, you can go to uh, this link, uh, the Git sub uh, HTML, and there you find a couple of extra slides with screenshots of what I'm about to do, basically. All right, so let's go to GitHub. Um, so this is the you this is the easiest way of making a, a new project, a new repository, is just go to the button new, <laughs> and then this um, field opens. Let me make this a bit bigger. And um, there are, you know, you could use a template, but we don't want to do that for now. We just want to make a really easy, simple repository. So I'll just call this my first repo. And then you can add a short description of what the plan with this repository is. So this is my first repository. Um, it makes sense to have a little bit of a description here, um, hopefully a bit more informative than this one. And then you have a couple of choices. So the first choice is, is this repository public or private? Um, it used to be that you had limitations on how many private repositories you can have. That is no longer the case. Um, but uh, so it kind of makes, you know, you can also change this later. Um, so for now, I'm going to make this private. Uh, but it's also fine to do stuff in public. So um, I tend to be a little bit more loose on the public thing. So um, Git repositories are work projects. Everybody knows this is not a finished product unless you kind of advertise it this way. So don't, feel free to also work in public uh, on, on some stuff. And then there are a couple of options. Uh, so you can uh, choose add a readme file. Uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, you can add a git ignore file. We'll do this later. And then you can also choose a license. Um, I will not do this right now, but uh, so there are kind of open source licenses that you can add um, uh, that you know tell people how they can use the materials that you share on this GitHub repository. And then you can just say, let's create a repository. And so what it does then it, is it opens this website with your first repository. So everything's already there to start working on this. Um, if you, uh, you know, look at other people's GitHub repositories, they will look pretty much like this. And so there are a couple of things that you can do in the GitHub interface itself. So for example, I can change the readme file. I can you know, start working with a couple of things and I can also go to settings. Um, and so in settings, you can change a few things. Like I can actually change the repository name, which I do not recommend. It makes sense to just stay with the one that you have. 
you can, I don't know, they have this new feature with social previews or whatever that is. Um, and then- uh, uh, Lina, we have a question. Yes. Chat. It says, can you create a repository directly from the RStudio terminal or do you have to use the GitHub website? So you can definitely create your uh, repository uh, from your laptop. I'm pretty sure you can also do this from your RStudio terminal. Yeah, from the terminal, definitely, but also using the interface. Um, it's only, it's a little bit more complicated. So there are a couple of things you have to do. You have to initialize the repository and all of that. And if you do it through the GitHub interface, that does it for you. Then you just clone it and I'll show you what that means in a second. So it's a little bit easier, especially in the beginning to just start on GitHub and then move over to your uh, local repository. So you first make the remote repository and then move it over, but both ways work. Okay, so as I said, a couple of settings are here. And one thing I want to point out is the danger zone. The danger zone is uh, um, where you can change things that will change your repository permanently and that will really make an effect, right? So you can change from private to public or the other way around. You can uh, give someone else ownership on the repository. You can archive the repository and you can actually also delete the whole repository. So that is pretty much the only way of like actually deleting all the information from your repository as well. So uh, this is basically destroying all the information that you collected in your version control. So unless you have a really good reason, I would not you know, go, uh, I, I would do very little, few things in the danger zone. So obviously making a repository public at some point uh, makes sense, um, but uh, deleting a repository is really a big step. Another thing that I wanted to point out is um, the manage access. Whoops, for that, I guess I have to, so it changed a few things on GitHub, as I said before, oh, that's not the right password. And um, this is also a little bit new. So uh, what you can do here is, well, you have a private repository, but you can invite collaborators um, on your repository. So maybe if any one of you already has a GitHub um, account, you can type your uh, username in the chat and I will add you as a collaborator on my first repo. I don't know if anyone already has that. Well, I do know, I think Mirza definitely has. Oh, there's the first one. I'll just take that. So there we go. Um, I guess that is the that's first, the first one. one. All right. So this is uh, our first person. And so now I have a collaborator. I invited that person. They still have to accept it. So pending invite, but that is basically how you can start working with other people uh, in your repository. Okay, um, so let's go back to the repository itself. Now, as I said before, we now have a remote repository. And if we wanted to go and work uh, uh, locally uh, in this repository, what we do then is we go to this code button and there are a couple of ways uh, that we can uh, then clone the repository, that means move it from remote to local. Um, and so uh, the, one of them is HTTPS. For most people, that is how you would start um, because uh, SSH means you need to generate an SSH key, you have to add it to your uh, profile and all that. So there are a couple of steps involved. Uh, if you don't wanna do all of this, and if you don't know what an SSH key is, then I recommend you just start working with HTTPS, which simply means that um, once you, you know, clone it and, and work with, uh, interact with the remote repository, you will have to type in your password a bunch of times. So I can just copy this um, link, which basically is the link to this remote repository. And then I can go to uh, our studio and start cloning the repository and then working in the repository. And I'll actually go back to my slides to explain a little bit more on that. Okay, so the way uh, you would do this in our studio is you go to file, new project, version control, git, and then you just um, plug in the URL of that that you, that you just got. So this, this is here the URL that I just copied over from uh, GitHub. Um, and it typically fills out the directory name, um, but you can also change that. 
And then you also have to tell it where should it save it, right? So where on my computer do I want to have this um, repository? I just have a folder that's just called Git with all my repositories in there. It's uh, getting a little bit big, but uh, that is probably a good way to start. And then you can say create project. Um, <clears throat> you then have to type in your username and password uh, for Git, for GitHub. And then it initializes the local Git repository. And so what's kind of nice about our studio, if you actually work in R, is that it will initialize the repository with an R project and with a Git ignore file. So once you uh, did this step in our studio where you cloned the repository, all of a sudden we have three files in, in this folder. Um, we have the readme. The readme file comes from GitHub, right? We, we had a, a readme file already there. And then we have the R project file and we have a git ignore file. And I'll go through uh, the git ignore file and the readme file here. So git ignore is quite nice because uh, it tells git which files might be in your repository that you really wanted to ignore. And uh, that is really useful for anything that has private information. Anything, you know, so for example, your our history or your our user data is probably something you don't want to have on a public GitHub repository somewhere uh, on the internet. Um, but it's also helpful for um, files that are tend to be big and you don't want to have them copied over every time you interact with Git. Um, so our data, for example, is something that is quite helpful to have in your Git ignore file uh, because usually these files are very big and you don't want to uh, move them anywhere. So that nice thing about using, working with our studios, it actually writes these four things in there already. So you don't have to fill that out anymore, but you can add things. So essentially each line in the git ignore file will give you one type of, of a file to ignore, right? So it basically says anything that has an ending dot our data is going to be ignored or dot our user data and so on. Uh, right, so these are going to be uh, un uh, not tracked uh, by um, Git. And uh, yeah, I already said all of these things. So one thing that's also really uh, important if you use our markdown, for example, and you use cache is that uh, there are also really big cache files that can be quite annoying to copy over to your Git repository all the time. So it makes sense to add, for example, TIFF files or EPS files um, to um, to this list of your git ignore. Okay. Um, the second file that I um, wanted to talk about is the readme file. So this is what we already had on GitHub uh, remotely itself. And so the this is the readme file of um, a workshop I gave on a Git and R Markdown. This is what the slides are based on for today. Um, and so what I tend to put into the readme file is uh, quite a bit of information about the project. So essentially, this is the first point of access for anybody who looks at your repository and wants to know what the project is about, including yourself in two years, right? So uh, there are good reasons, even if it's a private project, to take a little bit of care about the readme file and to document what's where um, so that you will remember that uh, when you want to work on the project again. A couple of years later. Um, and so the default for GitHub for the readme file is that it's a markdown file, which makes it quite easy to kind of um, to put a little bit of layout behind this, right? So the hashtag gives you a header, two hashtags is a smaller header, and so on. You can also use uh, um, um, a couple of other things. So if you ever used uh, R markdown, Markdown is uh, pretty much the same thing in terms of format. In terms of formatting, so um, that can be quite helpful to make this look a little bit prettier and more professional. Okay, so those are the files that we start out with, and then uh, let's uh, talk uh, for a few minutes about the workflow uh, that you can use if you want to interact and work with Git itself. Maybe there's a question: Is it oh, yeah. possible to add image slash figure to the readme file? Yes, definitely. So, especially images, no problem. Yeah, you can add those, and that's so. That's again, that's the same as in in our markdown, for example, right? So you can add anything. You can also add links. You can also add links to uh, subfolders in your repository. So you can say, oh, "Look here for uh, all the R code" or something like that, and then add a link for that. 
All right. Uh, so as I said, uh, we'll look at the workflow now. So all we did so far was basically just setting it up. So what do you want to do if you want to actually work with it? Um, and so um, we actually did some work, right? So we added two files uh, on our local machine. Our studio did that for us. It added a git ignore file and, a my, and a, our project file. And then maybe we also did some changes in the readme file. So let's say I typed some stuff in there, added an abstract or something. And so if you look at the our studio user interface for Git, this is what it shows you then. It shows you, OK, I have three files here. Um, the status of two of them is question mark. And the status of one of them is an M. Um, so the question mark basically means it's not added. It's not uh, uh, in the staging area. And it's also not committed or anything. So Git doesn't really do anything with the question marks yet. We have to tell it that it should do something. And so the first thing you would do is you would use git add. Um, there are two ways of doing that. One is using the interface. You basically just click those uh, little uh, um, tick marks. And then that means you stage, you put these files in the staging area. Another way of doing the same thing is using the terminal and just typing in git add and then adding the names of these two files. So git ignore and my first repo dot rproj. Um, if you do work with the terminal, um, one nice feature of Git is that it does autocomplete of file names. So you don't have to type out all of these things. Usually, if you just type the first or the first two letters, it will already kind of know what you need. So if you click tab, it will autocomplete uh, the file names. Um, one thing that's also sometimes the case, so for example, I believe if you use the GitHub user interface, is that git add and git commit are uh, combined. So that's the next step that I'll talk about. Uh, in our studio, that's not the case. So you first have to stage the files to make sure that uh, git knows, oh, I have to pay attention to these files now. And so if you see, once you click those, uh, the status changes to an A instead of a question mark. So something's happening. All right, next step, git commit. Um, so after you say git add, um, you would say, uh, you in the terminal, I would type git commit. Um, there are a couple of extensions of git commit. Uh, the one that I typically use is minus am that tells git all the files that are added should also be, all the changes to these files should be committed. So I'm going from the staging area to my local repository. And m just means message. And all um, commits from git have a commit message. So you have to tell Git, what are you, what's your intention? What are you doing with this uh, commit, right? Um, it makes a lot of sense to t pay a little bit of attention to that. Um, if you use the user interface, you can achieve the same thing by just clicking on the commit button. Um, but then a window pops up that tells you, type in your commit message. Because as I said, all commits have a commit message. So no matter what you use, uh, whether you use the user interface or terminal, you have to type in something. A little bit more about commit messages. Um, so uh, people tend to pay very little attention to these, but they can be very helpful. So um, uh, this is from the X XKCD comic, who they do lots and lots of jokes about Git. So if you uh, if you're into that, um, I can really recommend it. And you know, this is really what you see in a lot of uh, project developments. Is in the beginning, it's kind of nice and informative. And then at some point, uh, the commit messages just say, I did something. That's my go-to uh, commit message if I don't have time. But really, it makes sense if you ever want to go back in, in the version, these, Git, uh, these commit messages will tell you what happened, right? So if, let's say you worked on a specific analysis two weeks ago. And at some point, you realize, oh, there was a huge mistake here. I broke everything. You want to be able to go back to that commit to see what happened. Right, so then if you know what the commit message is, that kind of works as a tag and you know where to go and what to look up. All right, so third step, after you commit it, that means we're now in the local repository and we want to push all these changes to our, um, to our remote repository. To do this in the terminal, you would just um, type git push. Let me go back to, um, to the user interface. If you are in the user interface, you would just 
click the button push and it would do the same thing. So um, those two are pretty equivalent. And once, once you say git push, people are sometimes a bit scared because it gives you lots of information of what's happening. Um, so there's like a couple of, of lines that come up in the terminal. Sometimes there are even error messages between them. But as long as at some point it says writing objects 100% total, blah, 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 as long as it kind of shows you, okay, things are done, uh, then it also worked. So there might even be a couple of error messages in between. That still doesn't mean it didn't work. Um, all right, so now congratulations. After you've used git push, uh, you've really done it. And that means that your local and remote repositories are currently up to date with all your changes. So um, this, we're in the same, at the same level, uh, on the same uh, version level um, for all repositories. So that's great. And then let's say you did this in the evening after you finished working, the next morning you come back, the first thing you would do is um, git pull. So you want to pull information in case anything changed. It makes a lot of sense to do this completely automatically. So even if you know nobody did anything, it still makes, makes sense to get used to always do this before you work on a project because just in case someone did something, one of your collaborators worked on something uh, unexpectedly, um, you might be able to mess stuff up if you don't pull before you start working again. So it always makes sense to have that as kind of an automated thing. So before I start working, I'll just go to my repository, I pull, and then I get started again. All right, so to do this in the interface, you just click the pull button and in the, um, uh, in the terminal, you would say. There is a question in the chat or the mark rather. Uh, yeah. Just in case someone messed something up, shouldn't you fetch instead of pulling? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so there are lots of things that you can do to uh, make your life much easier. Uh, one of them would be uh, to use git fetch. Um, this, what I'm presenting here is basically the most minimal, uh, you know, path of working that you can uh, think of. And it's also, you know, for most people that's appropriate if you work in small teams or, you know, this is your master's project or something like that, where the most of the work is done, gonna be done by you uh, on your machine. And then not a lot of people who interact with that. Um, uh, if uh, projects get bigger and more professional, uh, there are lots of ways of kind of catching uh, small mistakes and Git fetch is one of them. Um, so, uh, I, I don't really have time to go into that, uh, but I, I do have a couple of extra slides uh, that I'll give you a link to uh, that explain a little bit more of you know what happens if things are messed up um, and, and how, you, how you can save it. Okay. Um, so um, this is basically it, right? So this is all you need to do, right? Get started, you do git pull, you work a little bit, you make sure all the files are added, um, all new files are added, uh, you commit them to the local repository, you push them to the remote repository, and then um, uh, you're done for the day, right? And next day you start with git pull again. Um, one thing that's quite helpful is um, if you want to know what changed since the last commit, um, you know, someone other than you worked on your project and you want to know what happened, you can use git diff to do that. In the RStudio interface, uh, that is called history. So if you click on the history button, you can see this. And what you can then do is you can look at um, changes uh, for a set, you know, for a commit for a certain file. Um, and then, you know, either changes that you just did. So that would be, okay, what did I just change in comparison to the last commit? But then also, okay, what did I, you know, what happened the last couple of uh, commits, for example. And then it's quite nice because uh, Git has this really beautiful way of showing you changes. It shows you, okay, so what was deleted is in red and what's new is in green. Um, it does this line by line. So uh, in this case, the only thing that changed is a, is a period at the end of the sentence, um, but uh, it still shows you, okay, there was this, this change, right? Um, in code, that can be super helpful because you see you know, every parenthesis that changed, uh, anything that, that happened, uh, you can see line by line. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, um, I, I typically now would go into detail on what happens if something goes wrong. And I promise you there will be something going wrong if you start working with Git. 
Um, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just uh, point out a few things. So the first thing and the most important thing that I want to point out is that you cannot really break things. You have That's why you have version control in the first place. So it's quite funny because um, I even read this last week on Twitter that someone said, well, it's so weird that it always feels like you're breaking something right away if you work with Git. And that's kind of funny because that's, that's the entire purpose of Git is that you cannot break things. So even if you mess up and everything explodes on your machine, you still have your remote repository that is going to be in some sort of good stage or the other way around. If you mess up your remote, remote repository, then you still have your local, right? So that's the first thing that's really helpful. And the second thing is you always can go back in versions, right? So if you mess up the current version, I can always go back uh, to the previous version and still have most of my work uh, saved. So um, there are in this, uh, in the additional slides that I um, mentioned earlier, I also added a couple of slides that just show you a couple of things you can do more or less step by step if you actually mess up and something goes wrong. Uh, one thing that's pretty common, especially in the beginning, is that you have a merge conflict, which basically just means, oh, your remote repository was a commit ahead that you didn't pull. And then you're trying to make changes at the same sp places, like for the same files um, with a new commit and something needs to happen, right? Some Somehow these needs to be aligned. And there are ways of dealing with that problem that are pretty easy. It's actually not that big of a deal. It just looks scary in the beginning because it gives you error messages and looks scary, but um, it, it's quite easy to do that. All right. Um, so for my uh, quick summary of this uh, very brief crash course, um, the most important uh, things you have to remember are these steps, add, commit, push, pull. If you, if you do this and if you work on a, a repository for a little while on a first project uh, regularly uh, and it will become automatic, then you know, you're basically halfway there to a really great Git user um, as a researcher, right? Once you have that, you can build up on that and can use other uh, um, things as well that, that Git uh, um, has, other features that can be really helpful. But these are really the most important ones. And I think for the first year that I used Git, I didn't really do much more than that. And that's fine, right? At some point you will get curious and start looking at branches and other things that you could do. The second recommendation that I have or summary is really just use it, right? Uh, this is really one of those things where you just have to become familiar with it. It's like um, you wanna move to R, but ultimately you always end up back at SPSS uh, then you'll never learn R fully. And that's the same thing, right? If you want to learn Git and you want to use it, but you end up with Dropbox every time, <laughs> then you won't learn it fully. And it, so it makes a lot of sense to just force yourself to work on a project using Git, um, you know, run into all these difficulties that people might have and then just deal with them. And then you will feel more competent about it afterwards. So that's really my biggest recommendation. Um, my th third recommendation is um, that the Git documentation error tracking are actually quite good. So usually, um, if you have an error in your GIS in your messages, or you know, you, use, you do something and you get a conflict, um, the output that Git delivers is absolutely amazing. So even if you have a typo in a Git uh, a command, it'll just tell you, hey, did you mean this? <laughs> You know, so it really, um, uh, they really try to help you along and that's, uh, that can be really helpful in the beginning. So I, I recommend really reading these things carefully and then, and then Googling, right? So most of the time you can avoid Googling because Git already tells you what you have to do to solve it. Um, so if you wanna uh, get started with Git, um, I also made a little bit of like a practice uh, assignment or something like that, that you can work through on your own. Um, so uh, you can go to that link here and then uh, take a look at it. I think I have it open. So this is what it looks like. Um, basically it just asks you, okay, make your own repository, uh, write a little bit in your readme. And then it also uh, kind of guides you through uh, making a first branch. Um, that is also something I talk about in these supplemental slides. And then also how to interact with Git repositories. So for example, if someone has data on a Git repository, 
how can you access it from our studio and actually, you know, um, use the information that is that is delivered there. So this is uh, if you want to uh, work with Git, um, you can you can try that out. All right. Um, let's see if there are any more questions. We still have I'm two minutes early. Wow. <laughs> Okay, I see there's, uh, there's, there are two questions in the chat. Um, the first one is whether I can give a future goal to Aspire, so an example of a branch-based workflow. Yeah, so you can actually look at those um, by yourself most of the time. So I believe, let's see if I can find one, oh, not here, find one quickly. Uh, oh yeah, so I work with a colleague on an R package, and um, she uh, so she developed this R package. It's um, by now it's also um, on um, uh, CRAN, so there's a release note uh, to it. And so the way you can see that there are de several branches, and so maybe for people who are not as familiar with this idea, the idea is um, we typically so what I you know if you have just one branch, so one uh, uh, yeah, then uh, it's usually the master. In this case, we actually have eight branches, which means you can work parallel, right? So some, you know, one person can work on one branch, another person can work on another branch, and in some at some point you merge different versions of the same repository back together in the master branch, and then you know uh, work uh, continue on with this. And so here we have that too. And what's pretty common is that you have a development branch. So uh, you make some development. And at some point, so she did all of these things here. She made some R code. It's, it's packaged, so there's a lot of documentation as well. And then and a very beautiful README, by the way. Um, and then at some point, you can merge that back into the master, and then other people can work on it as well, and so on. So what that looks like, uh, just um, to give you an idea with the branches, whoops, is this. So you have a master. You start out with the same product. You add some work. So there might be other updates in the meantime. And at some point, you merge your work back. Uh, so this is basically for, OK, I'm doing stuff where I can break things, but I don't want to break it on the master. I want to break it on my own branch. And then I, at some point, if I know it's stable and it works out, I can merge it back. Someone else can do the same thing, right? So this is what it would look like in terms of workflow. So uh, I would say most of, like, the nicest examples that you can find on GitHub are typically R packages, where people have relatively easy to follow workflows. It's not a super complicated product, but they still follow the Git guidelines a little bit more than uh, what I typically do. All right, the second question is, how do you make new branches in our studio? Um, so for that, I need to share something else. Um, open um, almost there <laughs> okay I need to open an R project with git in our studio and then share it um, Did that work? I guess not. Let me do this again. Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, here's uh, my um, um, our studio with Git, uh, and here's one um, button that just says new branch. <laughs> and then you can just say, oh, I want a development branch. Um, let's uh, call it this. Remote origin, that's your GitHub remote repository. So you can also add different remotes. You can also have a GitLab and a GitHub repository within the same repository, but that makes it really complicated and I cannot recommend it. So I'll, I'll 
for now will not sync it with remote, but obviously if you really wanted to work with it, you wanted to have this both on your remote and your local repository. And then you just say create, and then it will um, basically do this for you. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well then, thanks a lot for uh, your attention. And oh, there's one more question. Can we share the slides? Yes, you can share the slides. Uh, they are on the internet. <laughs> it's like a public repository. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, again, thanks uh, for being here. And I hope you start using Git. Uh, I really uh, love when people do this and, and, and then uh, working with them and collaborating. So it really can be a helpful tool. Yeah.